Hello, and uh, welcome to episode two of The Curious Marketer with Vin. Today, um, as a continuation of my quest to interview really interesting people, I am interviewing a woman named Teodora. Uh, is it Petra? Uh, Pet Pronounce your name. Petkova. Yeah, wow, you got it right. <laughs> Perfect. Teodora Petkova. Uh, real quickly, before I let Teodora tell the story, tell her story. Um, I think it's interesting how we met because uh, we met as a result of a post that was shared by David Ermelin uh, with regards to uh, Google Plus. In fact, <coughs> the title of it was Google Plus and the Beauty of Improvisation. And I have here the excerpt that caught my attention um, and, and sort of gave me some insight into Teodora as to why I might want to have a conversation with her. Uh, but here's the excerpt. It's very often on Google Plus, someone would start humming a tune as a consequence or independently, plusers from all parts of the globe would improvise on the same melody, interpret it, create new vibes, add various rhythm sections, or even change the pitch. Like a band or an orchestra whose invisible conductor is the innate need for and love of dialogue. And this dialogue, <coughs> this improvisation, is one of the most profound and magnificent ways of experiencing, not judging, not ignoring, not denying otherness. And I think it's a very rich excerpt from the post, but I also think it's an extremely accurate uh, metaphor, using jazz improvisation, if you will, is an extremely accurate metaphor of social media engagement, if not media, or, I'm sorry, engagement across uh, all forms, online and offline. Um, so with without further ado, if you will, I'll introduce Teodora and let, uh, right away, Teodora, I typically want to just talk about your story. I, I want you to give a little bit of a background. There's three areas that you can certainly talk about, but a little bit about your life, where you're from, how you evolved into the magnificent human that you are today, um, and then, you know, sort of give highlights in terms of events in Bulgaria, uh, SEOM, which is almost entirely in Bulgarian, so I wasn't able to glean too, too much from that. And then your own blog, uh, T for Text, which I find extremely interesting. But with that, go ahead and, and give a little bit about uh, who you are. Well, first, thanks for inviting me in this great series of yours. Um, and thanks for writing such an amazing introduction about myself. And also the, the excerpt, the clip that you just read sounds terrific with a male voice. <laughs> I have never <laughs> thought of it that someone would read it um, aloud while I was listening. Uh, who am I? Uh, the strangest thing probably that you don't know is that I'm a Latin teacher by training. I have taught stu uh, students at the medical university in Sofia, here in Sofia, uh, Latin for about five years. Wow. Wow. <laughs> and um, so you wanted my way to becoming the amazing person I am now? I know that's a difficult question because yeah. you're on your Google Plus page there's something about who I am to be continued or dot, dot, dot. Um, but you, you're, you're writing, first of all, you're, you, you're writing a couple of languages and I struggle to write in one. So I think your story is very interesting. I would love to know how you came to be a writer, um, but a little bit of background on the, the three projects that you have as well to give people a sort of context or contextual environment to, um, you know, the, the other types of things that we're going to talk about. Mm -hmm. Well, writing, I've always loved writing. It's not a passion. It's love, I think. Uh, I have a, a master's in creative writing. Of course, you cannot learn this. You need to have something in you that urges you to write. Uh, but probably for three years now, I have been I have been writing almost um, every day, and my job is closely closely related to writing. Uh, as for events in Bulgaria, uh, I wanted to create a site, a website, where I can express what I think about events and about sharing experience, not just visiting a country 
and seeing some cultural sites, but also um, visiting a country and sharing the experience with people, with local people, like this kind of um, energy flow and energy transformation and interactions. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah, so the, uh, of course I do. And so the, <laughs> events in, the events in Bulgaria is really your your project. It's it's mm -hmm. your little bit of, of giving people a taste um, of of your country. Yes, it is a, a taste of my country uh, throughout experiencing cool things uh, throughout art, music, etc. But it's an insider's view, so it's not a tourist perspective. It's an insider's view into. No, it's not. Mm -mm. Yeah. Very cool. Um, yeah. You know, I think it's the best way to appreciate another culture, anyways, is through the eyes of, you know, the the feet on the street, if you will, right? Yeah, right. And I met so many wonderful people with this project. Yeah, well, that's what part of the part of where you and I sort of crossed paths was. It, it, you were comparing mm -hmm. as you were interviewing. What was the artist's name? Uh, Mishu Yosifov. Right. Who is? I'm not sure oh. you will be able to say that again. <laughs> well, he's a <laughs> he's a Brazilian a jazz trumpeter, um, <clears throat> and in fact, uh, is awesome. I I. He's I, a Bulgarian. Uh, he's exceptional. And, and he was the he was the inspiration behind uh, your comparison uh, from from jazz improvisation to um, social media engagement, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He he was part of uh, I I mean this project. It's um, separated in several sections, and one of them is the interviews section, where I meet artists and try to talk to to them about their perspective. Uh, on the on the cultural life in Bulgaria and on what they do. Unfortunately, many of them are not working here. They work abroad and they're coming back to Bulgaria for only several times, just for a concert or a show. Now he's participating in a in a pretty prominent jazz festival in your country, uh, correct? Yeah, he's he's actually one of the co-founders of this festival. So with all this cultural uh, stuff going on with regards to Bulgaria, how do you end up writing about SEO? <laughs> well, um, throughout my work and my Latin um, adventures, let's say, I, I had a lot of side projects. Like I, I was writing for, for several companies as, as a freelance writer. And one of these companies was SEOM, the one that whose site you, you couldn't read. Mm -hmm. So um, I, yeah, I was doing these, uh, I was writing for them at the time when you could write a text, stuff it with keywords, and just put it somewhere. And they needed a lot of text, and I needed to write. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, honestly, <laughs> I I I wasn't aware that I was writing um, things that were that didn't matter. I mean, I was writing like I was writing now. I was not just filling filling the the text with keywords. I was trying to write good content, so and then. Hmm? No, go ahead. So uh, my boss, <laughs> uh, my current boss, uh, asked me to join his team a year ago. I wasn't sure I will make it in an office because I'm not a, I'm not an office guy, girl. <laughs> <laughs> but here I am, uh, one year and almost a half at the company and I feel very good. So at, at the very beginning he, he wanted to teach me SEO and I started as an SEO intern. But then my talent erupted 
and we saw that I couldn't be an SEO. It's just not me. So I continued writing. Do you feel the same way, given now your several conversations with some prominent people about semantic search and that side of SEO? Do I feel how? Do you feel the same way? Because I, I think your style is perfectly suited uh, to the, the new way of search in terms of being semantic. I've, I've yeah, this is what I feel too. Yeah, you're right here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's the, the, the moment I read semantic search, David Emerland semantic search. I knew that uh, writers will be now the the most precious people for for this, business. This is a this is a good segue into something that that's a, to me a important uh, distinction here. Can you can you a answer this question? Why do you feel that way? I've read half of semantic search and I know enough to be moderately not dangerous. Um, I'm curious. <laughs> I'm curious um, I, I kind of have a sense of the answer, but I'd like to hear it in your words. Why do you feel that way? What do you think the shift was? Uh, let me say something strange. Why do I feel that? Because I feel writers have intuition and have the ability to somehow predict or see a lot of things without... Um, without the necessity to... Uh, to see the overall technical picture. Uh, I will explain now. Uh, writers are very curious people, as you know, <laughs> and they write about a broad variety of topics. So, ultimately, they touch a, po um, a point everywhere and they can reach a lot of people with them being omnipresent uh, via their curiosity. You're speaking my language by the way. <laughs> I thought this was the craziest sentence I've ever said. No, no. <laughs> this was fact, too long. No, in fact um, I read your uh, formula for writing and I was going to ask about it in a little bit, but I think it's a great, maybe a great place to ask about it now and maybe ask about it again. But your formula for writing is 2 times R plus W plus E. And <laughs> the uh, first R is reading. No. Yeah. Yes, reading. Okay. That's it's what reading, doing. research, and the, the I, queen editing. So it's interesting because uh, I think what you're talking about to me it matters with regards to the two R's, two times R plus W plus E, and I think it matters because you're talking about writing and the formula for writing is reading. Well, I think that's the formula for anything worthwhile. The, the most successful people that I've come across in my life are, are avid readers. They read everything, and what happens when you read is you see systems. You see how things relate to each other. And I think that's the sort of essence of semantic search, how things relate to each other. And so by reading, uh, you're much better, particularly if you're reading a lot of different things, uh, you're much better able to see how things actually uh, happen in the world. Lovely. This is what I wanted to say, <laughs> but you said it better. Well, yeah, so systems, and one of my favorite favorites is analogy. Analogy, is this the right? Analogy is right, yep. Analogy, yeah. Because this is building bridges. Yes, well, no, it's the bridges that, it's the connectivity between concepts that uh, allow the great thinkers and inventors and innovators of our day uh, to, to create the innovations that they've created because they can see relationships that other people don't <laughs> see because they're, they're either not reading or not paying attention. Um, and I think reading has a natural byproduct, and that is observation. You know, when you're reading, you're observing, mm -hmm. you're reading the right things. You know, nonfiction novels, maybe not so much, but if you're reading a cross section of information, I think you tend to experience things on a much, a much more global scale. What do you think? I absolutely agree. I love this. The, um, before, I thought I have a scattered mind, and now I call it multifaceted brain or something. 
so many different areas we could cover right now because it all matters and it all directly impacts anybody who would pay attention to anything I would have to say about executing a business plan or a marketing plan. But I, I think writing and reading is key. Uh, I've, I've learned how to write better. I'm certainly not a writer per se. I've certainly learned how to communicate better by reading and writing. I've learned a lot about different things from reading and writing. Um, but I want to touch on something that's really important to me uh, because I, I tend to speak this way as well as write this way, which in some ways gets me into trouble. But your article, you wrote a you wrote a great article. I think it's I think it's awesome, and I'll be sharing it later. It's called the Metamorphosis in Search and Text. And, and the <laughs> excerpt in your article, there's a lot of valuable stuff in that article. But here's an excerpt that I think is is definitely worthy of probably three hours worth of conversation. But it's valuable ideas don't need pompous words. I could stop there, but and putting them into human language would mean <coughs> they have reached more people. This is not a simplification, but it rather makes room for natural content, content which is created on the basis of happening in communication, and this is what business is about. In other words, an exchange of services, goods, and ideas. I think the most important piece of all of this is, is that valuable ideas don't need pompous words, but you're putting them in human language and reaching the right people. Right? It's not really about what you want to say in, in representing how smart you are, but it's about clarity for an audience, which really Absolutely. is all things sales and marketing in terms of effective, right? Is Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is what I'm trying to convince a lot of people that I'm writing for. And some some just don't get it. Well, what, let's talk a little bit about the difference between simplicity and being pompous. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, I have a very simple, again, formula for knowing whether something that I wrote is nice or not. And probably the word is good, not nice. Um, let's say you're trying to define truth if something is true or not and when you're trying to define truth uh, there is only one def definition it is it's just it just is nothing else <laughs> it exists and that's it and you can feel it and then all of a sudden the simple becomes complex yeah. <laughs> well, because it is. So, you know, uh, for those that pay attention to anything I comment on, uh, whether it's Google Plus or otherwise, um, I have a, a vested interest in presenting that authenticity and truth is, very, is, is fairly complicated uh, just from the psychology of it, not from the understanding of it. But people are talking about be authentic. And I'm, I'm asking this question of you because you're talking about words and you communicate via the written word. And my feeling is that um, uh, being authentically you can be dangerous if your choice of words uh, comes across the wrong way. And I was curious to get your, your thoughts on that because I think it's dangerous advice to tell somebody to go write a blog and just be <laughs> themselves without real consideration of, well, what exactly does that mean? Yeah, you're right. Um, well, I'll ask it another way to make it easy for you to answer. No, no, no. I got your question. I, I was just thinking about an article I wrote today, which I'm very proud of, and I'm going to translate it and put it in different text. By the way, nobody knows about this blog. It's not public. It's not public yet. Okay. <laughs> but thanks for 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 reading part of it. Uh, so. When giving an advice, what a business should write about, I just said that they should write about what they feel is right. Isn't that a nice advice? What do you think? Yes, I think that's great advice. I, I, I am all about uh, being authentic. Uh, I Anybody that knows me long enough will tell you, yeah, he's he's pretty authentic. Maybe that's good, maybe that's bad, it depends on the situation. But yes, writing what you think is right is important. Um, 
but I'm, I'm, I'm also talking about, for example, if you sit down and you're angry and you start to write a blog, the words that you choose are going to come out as angry. And so your emotion or your state of mind comes through. And so, okay. so someone had said once, you know, be, be your friendly, authentic self. And I'm curious to know what you think about writing from a state of mind perspective in, in, in business and otherwise. Yes, writing about what's right is important, but also writing with, with the right message, using the right words in terms of the, the, okay. your state of mind mm -hmm. as you're writing. Well, I think writing should be and texts should be an open system. That means that they are not somewhere there alone. They are part of your context of a bigger discourse. And uh, even if you write a bad thing or an angry thing, this is not the end. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I agree. that's a great that's a great answer and a great perspective. There's another step, and this is just part of everything. You cannot just pull up, pull everything good, and uh, hide everything bad. Right. You just have to to let yourself be. Yeah. I know this is this m might sound far fetched for businesses. But uh, but I think this is the the right formula again. I think the trick is letting yourself be, but getting in touch with exactly what that is, so that what you are uh, isn't necessarily popular, but it's the best side of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I somewhere I I wrote a comment or was it a share that being yourself and having no audience is better than having an audience but not having yourself. Yeah, I think we agree there uh, for sure. Um, very much so. Um, you had a very interesting post, a summary of a conversation you had with, I, I believe it was David, but you said writers in Google Plus, uh, it seems like you're saying that being a writer on Google Plus can be both scary and rewarding, so I grabbed a couple of excerpts from the post uh, your summaries, if you will, of this particular post, but one of the things you talk about from a writing perspective is that interaction on Google Plus helps authors see a response to their content, and this makes their writing style and writings more suitable for and understandable by their audience, and I think I think that's an excellent point, but I also think it's a very scary point. You know, for example, musicians have this same kind of fear when they're, you know, they're up on stage, they're really expressing who they are through their instrument. Now a writer goes on to Google Plus, and instead of writing a book, that's published and now somewhere down the road where there's no connectivity, someone's reading your book, but you have no idea what the response is. Well, now there's an immediate response. And so there's a, there's a good and a bad there, right? Yeah. I, I, I know I like this. I saw that from David Emerland. I mean, I also thought that a writer should stay somewhere behind the scenes and produce his brilliant genius content and uh, just keep off any interactions so that his texts and his writing is not influenced by, by other people's minds. But then again, when I, when I joined Google and started sharing, I saw that this is not, this is not a working strategy or it's not working it's it's there's nothing wrong with sharing and with exchanging thoughts and people here are very very um, what's the right word for being they appreciate what you share and, and they 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 give away their emotion so that you can take it and transform it, and then give it back. Well, I think it's important too because you know when you're writing for business, you're writing for an audience. Um, when you're writing just to write, you may be writing to write a, to sell a book, so you're still writing for an audience, but in a different way. And so, in some cases, business writing isn't necessarily just about how you feel, but it's about writing uh, to please an audience, to give them useful information, or to 
write it in such a way that the language is, it resonates with them, right? So feedback, you know, versus just free form artistic expression is critical, and Google Plus provides a, a sort of a real time uh, mechanism for, for feedback, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. As for uh, I just rem uh, I just thought about your previous question about business writing uh -huh. and what would what should business people write? Uh, we had a very interesting conversation with my boss. He was sharing his experience about um, going in a shop where a person was selling floorings. So um, this person was a great expert. He he managed to uh, talk about an hour about any of the items in store. And then my boss went on his website. And the website was absolutely bad. I mean, there was no content on it. So if this person just sat somewhere and wrote everything he knew. This is content and this is what he should he he was supposed to write. Uh, so we agree if there's another if there's a way to agree beyond a hundred percent, we agree beyond a hundred percent. Um <laughs> you just you just touched on conversations I have with small businesses, uh mm -hmm. electricians across the board that say what would I write about in a blog? And I mm -hmm. say, well, You've been an electrician for 20 years. You've answered a lot of questions. <laughs> talked about a lot of issues. You know what you know. That's yeah. What you write about, and that becomes your marketing message. So, yeah, you're you're 100 percent right. This, you know, I tend to be. I'm full-blooded Italian, so I tend to be passionate. I tend to be extreme on both sides of the fence. And I've I've witnessed and I've noticed that uh, when you start to write, you got to be cautious of how these things come through. But generally speaking, I'm now starting to funnel in a direction that says, write about what's right. And you're absolutely right. It's not necessarily an emotional thing. It's a, a practical thing. And, and when you think of it that way, you're writing, particularly if you, if you really like what your, the topic of your, your content, uh, the writing sort of just happens, right? Absolutely. Uh, do you know Italian? No. I'm uh, Italian American. I'm only Italian American, but I'm full blooded. <laughs> So, no, I, I, you know I, only passion. No, yeah, I was even going to ask you, how did you become such a prolific writer in multiple languages? I I know Bulgarian and English. Do you, do you write in other languages? Because your your writing in English is is uh, remarkable. Ah, uh, is it? Probably. I, um, I had a talk with my fr with a friend of mine, and we we were discussing the fact that sometimes it's more convenient and more uh, comfortable to write in another language because you're somehow developing a new persona hmm. and probably not probably I think there's something in this that makes me writing in English in such a way. I don't write in any other language. I know Russian and I, I have started studying Italian because I love it. It's yeah. a lovely language. I'm slowly learning Brazilian Portuguese because my wife is from Brazil. So uh, Great. And, and my son is learning Portuguese from an early age and I, I don't want to not be able to talk to my son so I have to learn <laughs> the basics of conversational Brazilian Portuguese. but. Uh, uh, it's very interesting you talk about that persona in the that you're sort of assuming a different kind of a personality, um, at least outside of yourself when you're writing in a different language. I think that's a very fascinating perspective. I actually think it's a perspective that people should uh, consider when they're writing for their business because I think it comes across better. Uh, but again, I, I don't I don't want to get into the exploration of the metaphysical being in <laughs> because I think it's a very complicated, complex topic. And I think there's ramifications in a negative way and a positive way, depending upon your angle. But I know a lot of people disagree with me on this. Um, but we'll just leave it at that. Because I want to talk about a couple of other things. You have mentioned curiosity now uh, uh, several times. Yeah. Uh, I've read a number of things that you've written, and you mentioned the word curiosity. Um, 
I wrote an article a little while ago about this very topic, and the reason I wrote the article was because uh, I observed in my own travels um, on social media that when I was expressing curiosity in the right way uh, was when I was really starting to build relationships, was when I was building engagement, I was building the conversation. And yet I don't see a lot of the top dogs out in social media consulting world uh, use the word curiosity or give the advice of express your curiosity. And it's interesting to me because there were two ways that I looked at it. One, the power of curiosity and why it works. And two, that people are generally nervous to express their own curiosity because in a way it's expressing something they believe they're ignorant of. But I think that when I came across, when I was researching the article, I came across this guy, Richard uh, Saul Werman, who, a uh, very bright dude, uh, he, he is the, he's the writer of 70 some odd books, but he's also the founder of TED Talks, the TED Conference. Wow. But he wrote, uh, he did an interview uh, about curiosity, and there was a, an excerpt from the interview that I wanted to read here because I think you'll appreciate it. But he says, now if I say I have no skill sets and I'm ignorant, I have no repertoire. Therefore, I can do anything. I'm not selling my abilities. I'm actually selling my inabilities. And each of the tasks I do is the journey from not knowing to knowing. That's the journey of curiosity, from knowing curiosity, asking a question to knowing. That's the fundamental diagram, the backbone of the searching person. But I think what's interesting here is how little people talk about the power of curiosity, but you've mentioned it in a number of ways about why writers are so powerful, what, what is writing, but the a curiosity of how things are translated into the written word. But I think curiosity across just about every forum, uh, in every arena, if I were to go back and sell professionally, if I were to go back and practice as an accountant, I would be much more in touch with my own natural curiosity because it's a great conversation starter. I think it's a great tool in social media. I think it's an even better tool uh, for writing. Um, I was I was curious. Look, I, I call this the curious marketer with Vin. So I'm curious to get your thoughts on on curiosity, really. Well, my thoughts after all these. <laughs> <laughs> um, curiosity. I don't know why I'm thinking about the need to connect and I'm not sure if curiosity is related to that. Yes, it is. I think it is. So this is what just came in my mind when you were talking about curiosity. The need to go beyond, to reach out further and actually my my article today was called the thing finder so and i was speaking about and i was talking about um the importance of being open and um finding different things that might contribute to to the overall picture of your business and uh, the, the, the more things you have, the more, speaking about curiosity, the more curious you are, the broader your reach will be. I, like I say, I think we could talk about this for another four days, honest to God. <laughs> well, because I think it's a, it's a, it's a problem that, that you know, where, where Richard expresses people are afraid to say, you know, hey, I don't know. You know can you help me know? And, and in the, the industry that I serve is professional service providers, so they're lawyers and accountants and, and dentists. And by nature, they're, they're very accomplished individuals. They're very smart. Um, they have a domain expertise. They have an expertise. And I think they're taught their entire life, you know, to sort of never let that guard down and, and to be the person that says, you'll pay my fee because I know. So in reality, then they, they I think they have I think a lot of people have uh, an incredible uh, discomfort. They're incredibly uncomfortable with the concept of telling someone, hey, you know, I'm not sure I follow you on that. And I think they lose out. I've I've gone out through the you know through Google Plus. I, I'm constantly saying I'm not really sure I follow what you're saying here. 
because my mission is to understand. My, my goal is to break things down uh, to see how things work. So I have to know how things work. I can't take your word for it. Uh, otherwise, I don't know if I can either accommodate it, accept it, or discard it. So I'm constantly asking people to tell me, well, what do you mean by this? Because I don't know what you mean. And you're not being clear or I'm stupid, one way or another. If I can't understand it at its deepest level, I can't discard it or I can't add it to my, to my toolbox. Um, but in, in doing this, I realize that when you ask somebody a question and they're open to answering it for you, you engage in some really powerful discussions. But I think also writing, I think writing is important for business. I think if you're a professional and you don't have a blog at a minimum, I think you're making a big mistake. I think if you're engaging on social media and you're not asking questions, you're not getting as much out of social media. Um, but I think from your perspective, a writer, great writers, great thinkers, uh, great innovators, they're all curious. They're all, you know, science is the exploration of your own curiosity. You know, I'm not sure that works the way people are saying it works. I need to go explore it. And so then you have progress, right? Uh, Columbus thought the world was round. They said it was flat. He was curious. So he got in a boat. <laughs> and, he, and he went out and proved something he was curious about, right? These are the things that I think about. But I think, I think the big boys, the big girls, the, the, the gurus, if you will, they should talk about it more. Uh, they should be giving advice about how to express your curiosity because I think it covers a lot of ground. I think, um, I think people should freely admit when they don't know what they don't know. I agree, but probably we perceive curiosity in a different, in a little bit different way because I think that when you're curious, you're just going out and finding out. You're not asking. Or you are asking, and at the same time you're researching. You you are gathering perspectives, and you are um, combining your own picture. Uh, yes, I think we're, ta we're talking about the same thing. We're probably using a different language, and we might even be talking about different contexts. But I think you're exactly right, and and you you've you've identified it. You've you've sort of you've described it the way I would I feel it, and that is I'm I'm trying to gather. Uh, to form my own version of it or my own view of it or to explore it and, and add it. Uh, something something undiscovered, if you will, right? Mm-hmm. I, I think um, You have a lot of questions for me, a pile of papers. No. I just wanted to add something to, to, uh, want to share something Please. that I'm not sure about. Uh, the domain expertise you said. Mm -hmm. um, I was always wondering about this. How do you become an expert if you are super curious and you have not decided to localize yourself yet? And you use this uh, this fluid self for being a writer, for example. So, if you if you pay attention to me long enough, you'll see that instead of saying content is king, I say context is king. And so, to answer your question requires at least some discussion of uh, situational context. And so, as an example, a uh, great musician. Since we we met regarding jazz, I'll give you the piece on on on, on studying music. Uh, the great musician never stops studying music. Um, the most advanced musicians uh, never stop studying music ever. Um, they practice and play and explore until they're dead because that's that's what they do. The, the playing is the exploration of what's new. And yet, when you hear a master play, you'd say they're a master. But in the master's mind, they're not done growing. They're not done mm -hmm. learning. Mm -hmm. For, for, for those in America who might be listening to this broadcast, I'll even use Peyton Manning, who's an American quarterback, plays for the Denver Broncos, considered one of the greatest quarterbacks in the history of the NFL. He said in an interview prior to the game, the Super Bowl game, that he didn't play very well, and he said, next year, I feel like I can get better, that I haven't reached my full potential. I mean, this is a master. This is a guy who is, is arguably one of the greatest athletes of our time, and he's saying publicly... I'm not done growing. And so contextually, from a learning perspective, you never really experts never really have a domain expertise in their own mind. 
But now if you shift that context to I'm a lawyer or I'm an accountant and I provide a service to somebody, well, now that I'm selling my expertise, I have to present my expertise in some way, shape, or form for the benefit of commerce. But that's the external because I'm still not going to consider myself an expert because I'm not done learning. How's that? Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> You know, there's so many different ways to answer these questions because you need the context. You can't just answer them, I don't think, in, in any one way. But people, and this is why I talk about professionals and how funny they are because they get married to the concept of I'm an expert. But <laughs> the experts that I've met in my lifetime don't think of themselves that way. They're constantly, you know, looking. And then the other thing is it's all relative. So to my wife, I'm an expert in sales and marketing. To Bill Gates, no, nah, maybe not Bill Gates. To um, what? To my wife, I'm an expert in content marketing. To Joe Polizzi, I'm not. <laughs> to my wife, I don't. She doesn't know the further thing about semantic search. So to her, I'm David Amerlin. To David Amerlin, <laughs> I'm illiterate. You know, I'm a complete bozo. So you know, it's all it's all relative in terms of what you know, the situation, who you're comparing yourself to, if you're comparing. But generally speaking, I think expertise is uh, is a difficult concept because I think the real masters never stop being a master. They never stop striving to be a master. That's why they're masters. Wow. I like that. Well, let me ask you this. Are you familiar with, um, what's his name now? Um, Wes Montgomery. He's a jazz guitar player. Are you familiar with him? No. Okay, Wes Montgomery was considered easily the top five jazz guitar players of, of modern man. Uh, he is a legend. Uh, he, he innovated. He renovated. He completely disrupted the entire jazz guitar universe. And he will. He would have told you if he weren't dead. He he passed away a long time ago. But in just about every interview, he talked about how he hated his performance after just about every performance. And this man was a musical master. But this is how he perceived his own playing, because his mastery was relative to him, not relative to you. Yeah. So in his mind, he hadn't mastered it yet. We went metaphysical again. Yeah, well, I know, and that's you got me <laughs> off board, and that's okay because you said this. You said this was good, but you know what? I like that because it's this a, a, this a jamming, about, right? You know, I don't want to talk about sales and marketing entirely, but all these things to me lead back to sales and marketing because uh, one of the things that I do and try to talk to professionals is to say you have your domain expertise and I have mine. Um, you're a lawyer, you're an accountant, and, and you know what you know, but you don't know what I know. And to know what I know is not easy. And so uh, there's a reason why you would you pay me for my services, and I believe that from my core. So whether we're metaphysical or otherwise, there's a practical application to all of this. Um, but we can you can sort of move past that um, because what I wanted to know was uh, this – I don't know if you even want to talk about this, but everybody wants to talk about this. So I was curious to ask to see what your response was. Um, how do you measure what's your benchmark? You're you're in a marketing situation. You you write for an SEO company. How how do you measure your success? What are your benchmarks from just from a marketing perspective? Well, Well, I measure them with engagement. I measure them with uh, with the people I have convinced to follow me as a nice writer. <laughs> okay. Is this so, so you're not going to like the next question then, because what I wanted to ask you was, what do others use as a benchmark for your success? You I don't know. You have a company you work for. I'm curious what they, what, what they, what they, I, and if there's no answer to it, fine. I wanted to ask because I wanted to see how you would answer. Well, uh, I think the more the more I grow, the more 
my so-called boss is happy with that <laughs> because I can produce better and better content and I can uh, uh, interact with more people and we can just do business with more people and this is not about just selling or pitching it's about interacting so I, I asked the question because um, I wasn't sure how you would answer it, but I, I wanted to make this point uh, clear as I go about my travels that everybody wants a metric, right? Everybody wants what they call a return on an investment. Um, but there's, a, there's an indirect return in all of this, and engagement and relationships are really important, particularly when you're selling services. Um, you know, you're, you're not doing this. Content marketing isn't just for conversions. Um, although conversions come, it's it's a broader concept. It's about building better relationships, which I think is why we connected so well was because of the way you describe social media engagement. It's a perfect description. It's listening and, and adding your piece as, as you're listening to the landscape of what's or what the conversation is. So I think writing, I think blog writing, I think content writing, I think content in general um, is less about strictly, uh, you know, conversions and business even though those may be natural byproducts than it is about building connections, building connections with the right people. Is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah. Uh, there, there, um, I heard something at the, I was at a Webit Central and Central and Eastern Europe Summit and there was a guy speaking there and he said we should think interactions not transactions. I really like that you added that. Mm -hmm. I really like that. I like that a lot. You should think interactions, not transactions. That's actually very difficult to get across, um, at least in, in Western civilization as it relates to America, because transactions are king. Um, but uh, I think interactions are, if, if transactions are king, then, then, then the, the interaction is, uh, well, let's say transactions are the president, interactions are the, <laughs> the board. <laughs> yeah. Interactions, because I think interactions, well, let me put you this way, this is what I used to say to people about selling. I can't sell unless I interact with people. So we've got to work on getting me more interactions. Because if I can't get an interaction, how am I going to sell? <laughs> Everything starts with the interaction, right? I think the interaction is the pinnacle. So all the things that you do, if they build the interaction, are critical. And there's, you know, it's a very simple two-step process. Interaction transaction in its simplest form. You have an interaction that results in a transaction. You can't have the transaction without the interaction. Mm -hmm. You're right. And speaking about metrics, I think that they are not so bad. I mean, we should use them especially for content, for realizing who your, um, what's your audience, mm -hmm. whom are you addressing, Yep. Who is reading you? Uh, what are these people doing? Where are they coming from? So, especially in this era, we cannot just write for everybody. And we need to use metrics to custom content, to customize content. There's a place for metrics as well because even in the interactions, you have to make sure you're interacting with the right people. Um, so you you had this project that I glossed over, and I didn't want to necessarily burden you with a bunch of questions, but I, I really want to know why why that it, it hadn't taken off. Uh, how how do you so what is it to be unique? You know, yeah. There's a million different ways we can talk about this, but in terms of a small business or any business, uh, developing a niche is one way of being unique, but even even without uh, developing a niche or being within a bigger niche, you still have to be unique. And so what, what you're talking about with regards to metrics, um, you know, metrics are a great way uh, to measure how effective you are within a defined uh, sec target, a target market or market segment, if you will. Um, it's a great way to determine, metrics are a great way to determine if anything that you're doing is resonating with the right people. Uh, not with the wrong people, with the right people. So it's not a free form, if you will. I don't believe in content for the sake of content. Um, but, you know, I think metrics do serve a purpose. But what do you feel, 
how do you feel and where is this project with regards to uh, being unique? Has anybody responded? <laughs> yeah, a whole lot of 16 people. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't responded yet because I was preparing for this and I saw it and I was going to respond later, but because my perspective on being unique is is, um, is probably unique. But um, <laughs> I think being unique is an important thing. I, I'm a big fan of a guy named John Jansk who's the founder of Duct Tape Marketing and and his whole marketing system starts off with a definition of your of your of how you're different. how What's your core message and does it separate you from everybody else? Uh, and, and that's one of the ways to stand out, if you will. I think being unique is important. I think having a niche is important. But what do you what you know? How do you feel about you being unique as it relates to personal as well as professional? Well, I think the most the most important for being unique is not trying to be unique. <laughs> I mean, you are unique. All your experiences are unique. You just have to realize that and keep going. I don't think trying to be unique uh, would get you to the to the holy land of uniqueness. No, I think then ultimately what you get is you're fake uh, instead, of, <laughs> instead of unique. You end up. Yeah. Being, <laughs> you're a unique fake. <laughs> uniquely fake and, and transparently <laughs> fake, uh, to say the least. And so your message is completely wasted. But I think one of the things from a writing perspective is. Uh, when you're writing, uh, go out and look at uh, your competitors and make sure that you sound nothing like them. Um, and so one of the easiest ways to do that is to, of course, write write what's coming from you instead of writing what you think everybody wants to, to read from a marketing point of view. But certainly, there's an, there's a, 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 we're inundated with the same old, same old message. You know, we're going to save you money and help you reduce cost. But there's not a lot of uniqueness in these cliche sort of terminologies, if you will. Right? Yeah, yeah, right. You're very unique. I think your writing style is very unique. Uh, I don't think you have a problem with that because you are a great writer. Um, but being unique is also a scary thing, whether it's business or otherwise, you know, because you're Absolutely. It's, it's scary. It is. It's scary to be, you know, you and hope that business is going to come from it. Uh, it's also scary to develop a niche and think that your business is going to thrive by, by turning away others. But by default, the, the prof profitable businesses do uh, healthy, healthy profitable businesses turn away uh, businesses that are, uh, you know, customers and clients that are outside their niche. What do you think? Well, I think that it's not that uh, complicated for a business to be unique if they just are being true. I know this sounds strange, but if you just write what you think, you will get the audience you deserve. And then... <laughs> <laughs> and then probably you can uh, evolve throughout the throughout what's wrong why are you smiling well, why are you laughing because you definitely might get the audience you deserve but it might not be the audience you want <laughs> okay so what's what's the formula for getting the audience no, you want I think you're 100 what do you right. think I think you're hundred percent right I'm laughing because you know that that concept of karma you know, where you sort of get what you give, you know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. I was sort of having an internal joke with myself with regards to, you know, example, <laughs> how you express yourself because you're going to attract, uh, you know, the wrong people, right? You may <laughs> not get the clients that you want. Um, you may get just what you're, you're writing to, which is precisely what you don't want. Um, it was more or less a sort of an internal conversation I was having in my own head. Um, I wanted to ask you what's next? for you where do you go from here well I'm continue continuing working at SEOM I'm going to write for my blog hopefully more and I have a very ambitious even more ambitious 
ambitious than your questions for me, strategy about events in Bulgaria. I have some interviews for, for a lot of people across the country because there's a lot of interesting festivals and I just want to write about them. And you're just doing this because you like it. Yeah. That's amazing because the, the pages are, are really impressive. Um, you're putting a lot of work into it. Yes, I am. I really believe in that. And th this, I, I meet a lot of great people through this project. And I think it's a nice hobby. Why not? Well, I, that's kind of the reason I'm, part of the reason anyways I'm doing this is uh, because, you know, you get to meet some pretty interesting people. I mean, uh, I hadn't given a lot of thought to Bulgaria um, until now. Until, uh, until I met you. And so there's yeah. a lot of unexplored territory out there, and I'd like to explore some of it, even if I can't get in an airplane and do it myself. But you never know, someday down the road, maybe I'll, uh, I'll come see that jazz festival. Yeah, you should. Uh, actually, did you listen to the Bulgarian jazz I sent? Yes, I listened to some, and I found a lot mm -hmm. of videos um, on my own of that gentleman playing. Um, and he's, he's actually well known. I meant to connect with you because there's somebody here that would like to connect with you. He's a jazz educator. He happens to be my guitar teacher. Um, but he hosts artists from all over the world at seminars and shows at the university that he's uh, a professor at. And he wanted to connect with you um, on a lot of things. Uh, but he's very familiar with the, 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 the trumpeter and uh, was curious to learn more. Um, from an exploration perspective, but I'll connect you guys, you know, after this uh, session and in the next couple of days. But I, um, I did listen. I think it's amazing. Yeah. See, I, I was writing, and I attracted the right audience. No, you definitely did. I, I think that it's a really important point. And you know what? Let's let's chat about that for just a second because I, sales and marketing is all about attraction and resonance, relevance, however you want to call it. But yeah, I was I was perusing a, a conversation on Google Plus and I saw one little paragraph and the, the words that you used got inside my head. And it's 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 a great it's a it's a great story um, for how people should approach their sales and marketing and I'm I'm learning more and more about it and I'm I'm trying to do more and more of it in my own uh, sales and marketing. But I think uh, you're absolutely right and you've built at least one solid relationship and maybe some more because I'm a huge fan. I follow a lot of what you do. I really like your wow. articles. I think your articles are great. Thanks. So, I think your show is great. Well, we'll see I hope goes. to see a lot more people joining it. We'll see how it goes. That you're, you're, you're number two in terms of the, the yeah. online interviews that I've had. And in, in, in Wendy Hernandez last, last week was, was awesome as well. And so I feel great about the people that I'm talking to, and they're making uh, the conversation as far as I'm concerned. And I got a number of them lined up, and I hope they're as interesting. Although, although you're a hard, hard one to top. You, you are unique. <laughs> you are unique too, and curious. <laughs> so, with that, um, just hold on one second. I'm gonna, I'm gonna shut down the broadcast. And thanks for the folks that were listening. And um, I think I might do one next week. I'm not exactly sure, but this would conclude this particular discussion. And between last week and this week, I'm going to convert these um, discussions into a nice blog post with more information about the folks that I uh, had conversations with. And if you're interested in, in having a conversation like this, please do um, reach out to me. So thanks. Thanks, everyone. Bye.